Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, a work in progress. I feel like I've been roped into this because somebody else said, it's compaction, and that was it. So I have many collaborators and co-conspirators involved in this, and this is very much a work in progress. Brendan is responsible for kicking this all off in that he showed me a couple of capacitance probe data sets uh, well, a year or so ago and said, look at this, what do you make of it? And I went, ooh, trouble at mill. And he said, yeah. And then we sat down with Tom, because we didn't know how bad it was, and we went, oh God, trouble seems to be everywhere. So that was nice. Eckhart now unfortunately has to pick this all up and make more sense of it. So any questions you have for me today, I will scribble them down and let Eckhart know that these are what you want answered, because he'll do that. Fanny in the meantime is running around on a CRDC scholarship, trying to make sense of some calls, which we're trying to replicate what I'm gonna show you and talk to you about. Um, Brian and Nelly are basically holding my hand on several other bigger projects that all ties into this. But I said, this is compaction. And I was thinking, well, am I talking compaction really? Well, what is compaction? I got down the di dictionary. I still have dictionaries and encyclopedias on my shelf, so I got mine down. And the first one I found was, it's the process of compacting or being compacted. Yeah, rubbish, don't like that one. Next, I'll go online, Google dictionary, here we go. It's the act of crushing, hurrah, brilliant, that's really good. And then I found one I really liked, compaction, an increase in the density of something. And I thought, well, is what I'm looking at compaction? How do I make a soil more dense? And the answer is easy. You knock out the porosity. You squeeze all the mineral bits together. It's more dense. It's compacted. Yes, that's what I want. That's my definition of compaction. And why? Because when you think of compaction, what do you think of? Oh, well, hopefully John's talks just stimulated you to think of that big green and yellow thing wandering through your field and knocking the crap out of your soil. Great. Of course, it's harvesting cotton, making you money, so that's all good. So you think of these wheel ruts. You don't often, though, turn your thoughts below ground to that area, those bits, the underneath bits that we were just hearing about and how what's happening there. But I want you to do that because I think we've also got a problem with compaction that's not just from mechanization. There's an elephant in your paddock and you're ignoring it. Some of you at your peril. There's an elephant in the paddock. It weighs about four tons. That's fine. We now know that the 7760 weighs 32 tons. It's a bit heavier. But the thing we're ignoring is this wet stuff. Water. We just heard about how important water is in altering our bulk densities and how it's going to affect the way in which our soils behave. Yes, yes, and yes. But it in itself is also causing us a problem. Every time we irrigate, we're putting water onto these soils. It has weight. Janelle tells me you're adding 8.5 megalitres on average to a hectare. That weighs 85,000 tonnes. That's a lot of weight. But it's water, and it's all spread out. So its downward force is actually pretty low. It's only about 1,000 newton, uh, newtons every metre squared. The elephant is about... 50 times that. Your JD7760 is about 10 times the elephant. Whereas we just heard it's better than a sheep roller. So it's like, yeah, that's a lot of mass. But this water is doing other things as well. It's helping to cause slaking and dispersion in our soils. We know this. We know it happens with rain. We know it happens with irrigation. We see the brownies coming off in our tailings. That soil is basically being taken apart with that water, and as it moves down the profile, fine particles of clay are carried with it. We know that's happening. We know that where we have sedicity, that problem is made worse because we get worse dispersion, so again, we see more of that sort of silting up process. The actual nature of agriculture as well adds to this problem. As we plow, as we sow, as we cultivate, we take out some of the organic matter, our aggregates become destabilized, and when they get wet, they fall apart more easily. So water has a big part in all of these. And as we reduce the organic matter, we also reduce the ability of the soils to feed themselves. Their mineralization potential is reduced. The amount of carbon that's holding it all together is reduced. So the labile pool that feeds the biology that helps stick it all back together for us is reduced. So water is coming into play, and it's resulting in a lack of porosity. At least that's what we thought it was. So what I want you to think about then is it's something big and blue as well as something that's big and green that's causing a compaction issue. And what does it mean? As we compact our soil, it basically means that the water can't get in. It also means air can't get in and air can't get out. So our systems become anaerobic. It's the equivalent of having them waterlogged. 
it's not good for cotton. It likes a nice aerobic root zone. So that's what we see happening. There is exchange happening here, and it's important we remember that. But we ask ourselves then, well, is this actually happening? And the good news is, yes. Well, good news for me. Um, here's a farm, distant from here, quite a ways away. And the farmer very kindly did what I would expect anyone to do when chased with a water challenge, irrigated like bilio, and made the problem worse. But I looked at this, and okay, you might say it's capacitance probes, it's not 100%, but it's not bad. And it's the way in which they behave is what we understand. And as you can see there, well, the first thing I take away from this is I look down at the orange line there at 50 centimetres. There's not much root activity down there. That cotton crop is really only growing with its roots in the top half a metre of soil. It's not got down much further. It's not accessing water and nutrients from down that profile. That's the trouble. That's the problem. Now, I know this soil's sodic. I know it's also saline. And I also know that when we dug some pits out there that the roots didn't go below 40, 50 centimetres. That's fine. But I also look at this and say, well, what are all these flat bits on these probes? And then I get out my old water pack. I have mine on the shelf, but I still use the computer one now because it's more easy to search. And I look at that and I go, well, the flat bit there is on each of these pre-irrigate or post-irrigation sections there, tells me that soil's sitting fairly waterlogged. And then I see a bit of decrease, but I'm worried. The roots aren't getting down there. And the farmer worried. He only had two fields under cotton. And suddenly, after about his fourth irrigation, he noticed his profile didn't recharge. So what did he do? He thought, oh, damn, I need to get more water on. So he shortened the irrigation schedule. And what happened? Oh, the problem got worse. He got even less of a recharge. So what did he do? He shortened the irrigation window again. Oh, it went wrong again and again and again and again to the point he was literally throwing water from one paddock to the next. And this is what happened. He wasn't getting recharge. And he said, what's going on? And we said, well, basically, you've, you've saturated your soil. We know from the depth profile your roots aren't down at depth. You're not drawing that water back out. The cracks aren't reopening. The water's not getting down. And your problem's exacerbated because you've got a sodic soil. These are all ideas we're thinking. That's a sodic soil. And then I get really excited when a grower sends me similar data from a non-sodic soil. Because now it's more about actually the, the way in which these clays behave. It's clay soils again. This farm's not 100 miles from here at all. The roots are quite happily active at 100 centimetres. But you see the lower four or five bars of that capacitance probe data shows absolutely no recharge after about the fifth, extract, the fifth irrigation. Sorry. He's made the field wet. And then what happens? You put the water back on. But the water's not getting back into the whole profile. It's getting hung up. It's getting stuck. <clears throat> so the profile looks like it's drying out. What do you do as an irrigator? You turn the taps on more. They did. They ran more water more often. They shortened the irrigation to every seven days. And they run that water for 12 hours. That water logs your soils. I reckon these soils were already waterlogged. What does the cotton plant do when it gets waterlogged? It stops playing with potassium and other elements. And it goes, oops, I'm going to shake a few bowls off here and there. And that's what it did. And they got premature senescence. And what yield they did get, which they described as low, 10 years ago you'd have been happy with it. But nowadays you'd probably say, yeah, it was low. Had really poor micronair. So a big penalty. But you think they're doing the right thing. So it's happening. So what is this problem? Well, basically, what I'm arguing, or what I'd like to put to you, is that you have that irrigation schedule. You tuck on your water. It gets into the profile. First off, it goes down through the cracks. But you have to let the plant suck it back out to a fairly large extent. If you don't, those lower pore channels that allow the water in, well, that clay swelled up. It's closed them off. They've not opened up again. And when you run on that next irrigation, where those are blocked by air or blocked by water or just blocked by the fact that clay is swollen, the water doesn't get into depth. That's why you're seeing these shortenings of these irrigations, that the profile's not resaturating, because it can't, because it hasn't dried out enough. And all you end up with doing is actually putting less water in, which raises that level of saturation, and on the next one you get less and less and less again. Vicious circle. And where you've got salinity and sodicity issues at depth as well, this problem appears to occur quicker, and you have rooting issues in your cotton too. So is it occlusion or is it compaction? Well, it is a nature of compaction. We ran around very quickly with a penetrometer last year. We'd like to do a lot more of this. The red diamonds, if I draw your eyes to those first, that's an area of a field that was said to be poorly yielding. And what you can see there is at about 20 centimeters, there's a shoulder of about 
1,500 kilopascals of resistance. That's quite a lot. Um, for comparisons areas, there's an area 100 meters from it where the, the yield was said to be pretty good to average, if not better, and an area that was said to be high yielding in the field. And there we don't see anything like that kind of level of resistance in the soil until we get down to about 50 centimeters or beyond. For additional comparisons, there's a dry land crop that went to 7.5 bales to the hectare. That soil was pretty good. Not bad, a bit hard on the surface maybe, but perhaps that was just their, their first year in the cotton in this place of field. Um, and then there's another field I've stuck on there where it was only rooting to 60 centimetres. We know that. We saw that from the capacitance probe. We dug a pit and we saw the cotton 60 centimetres. Again, that soil is hitting really high levels of resistance down there at 50, 60 centimetres. No wonder the roots aren't going beyond that zone. And these appear to be linked. So we're squeezing the life out of their soil. Yes, we are. Can they recover? I'm assured that they can. I am told by a soil chemist who I trust much more than myself in chemistry that to knock the properties of our shrink-swelling clays out of them, we'd need a thermonuclear device. He hasn't got one to test this, which I'm quite relieved by because I think he's the kind of guy that would, but he tells me he needs something short of that to, to knacker them so they can recover. But to do that, they need to go through these wetting and drying cycles. They need to actually be allowed to open up to shrink and swell, to re-crack properly. So, how do you do that? Well, you don't irrigate too early. If I just quickly flick back to that one, that's his recharge line. That's his 50 mil deficit. He never got to it. He never actually got to a point where those plants were struggling. He turned on the tap too early, in my opinion. Admittedly, it's not my crop, so you know, I'm not running the risk, but he did it, and that's what happened. Conversely, some of the people we're talking with and working with now are looking at using crops that will get down deeper to actually suck the water out of these profiles. I think we were going to hear maybe about using sorghum to do it, safflowers or anything. Some of these people are looking at barley because they have a bit of solidity. Yes, it will get its roots down there. Yes, it will help dry these soils back out and help hopefully recover that shrink swelling property. But if you're going to do that, what you can't do is turn on the irrigation water to drive up your yield because you're missing the point. All you're then doing is keeping the soil wet and then it doesn't dry out properly so you don't get that connectivity back again. It becomes a, a bad word, I'm afraid. You almost have to treat it as a sacrificial crop. It might not yield to action potential, but if you need to recover your structure in these soils, you've got to do it. What about gypsum, we've heard? Well, gypsum's great on the surface. We know it will help you with your stability and your structure, but it might actually displace sodium that could cause a further problem at depth. So I'd hold off maybe, or, or think about it. Do you need it? PAM, same idea. Could work as well, but look at your water packet. It'll tell you when PAM's good and when PAM's not so good. And again, these issues are occurring in this kind of 30 to 50 centimeter zone. So you need to get it down there. Is that easy? No. What about putting carbon back in the system? Yeah, there's a thought. Cover crops, organic matter. Let's rebuild the carbon and have our systems become more stable that way. Yeah, maybe, but it could take a very, very long time to put even just a fraction of a percent of carbon back into these soils. And that's not a quick fix, so maybe not the best bet. So, I'm going to wrap it up. Key messages. These aren't new issues. We've been here before. We've maybe just forgotten a little bit about them. But perhaps we're now more attuned to actually looking at the real causes of them. And they're not everywhere. We reckon sitting down with Tom looking at his data set that about one in three fields is affected, maybe as much as 40%, which is what we know from work done in the 80s is the equivalent number of dispersive soils that are in the guider anyway. So it's just about managing what we have and remembering what we have. Are these subsoil constraints affecting yield? We don't know. We're looking now. We're trying to match up that data. Chances are there's some impact, but cotton is a beautifully adaptive plant. I mean, already we've got a tree that we're growing as an annual bush to make something white and fluffy. It's coping with these situations and doing some phenomenal stuff. So we don't think there's a yield penalty directly at the moment, but it could happen. And we know that where we're seeing large fields affected, growers are saying, I didn't get as much as I wanted. So there's some yield there. Is it loss of porosity? Is it blocking? Is it compaction? It's all of these things. It's definitely an increase in the density in the soil. And we see that when we look at penetrometry on the back of the capacitance data. So what do you do? Well, you've got to manage it. You basically have to know that if you like to encounter this, you can't go too early with an irrigation. You've got to let that soil get down there towards that dryness. You've got to run the risk of maybe, maybe just going a bit short on the water. 
we've been doing, we've done so much work on water use efficiency. Use it efficiently. Put it on when it's right, not before it's needed. Um, because when, when we do that, when we look at that response, it makes this issue worse. Because all we're doing is we're raising that flooded level in the soil. We're not allowing those pores to open up again. And if they don't open up, the water can't get down, the roots can't get down, the air can't get back up. The system will start to shut down quicker than we hope. And why do I say it's not new? I say it's not new because Arthur was doing stuff about air flux 30-odd years ago. Um, he then moved on to water logging, but it's the same kind of issues. It's about his water-filled pore space and his wet soils. And I think the bit that scares me most about this is that, as Arthur said all those years ago, if you want those cracks to open back up again, you've got to get down to wilting point. Now, wilting point is definitely bad. There's no denying that. The whole point of it being called wilting point is the plant is wilted. We don't really want that. But you do, I think, want to get towards a point when you're using your capacitance probes or any other form of soil moisture management that says the plant is now having to pull. I don't want it going, I can't pull, and popping all its cell membranes and walls apart. We don't want that. But I think you have to allow it to get down to dryness, especially if you've got these kind of soils that are likely to actually say, you know what, I'm going to give you a hard time with your irrigation this year. It's tough. I'll be quiet. Thank you.